Welcome to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating Systems Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershot, Scalvin, and Gagney, published by Wiley Publishing. I'm very grateful for the resources that the authors and the publishers provided for this series. Thanks to all. As I said, this is Lesson 3. This lesson will continue our introductory series, providing an overview of the course. Multitasking is the logical extension of multiprogramming. In multitasking systems, the CPU executes multiple processes by switching among them, but the switches occur frequently, providing the user with a fast response time. Consider that when a process executes, it typically executes for only a short period before it either finishes or it needs to perform an input-output operation. The input-output may be interactive. That is, the output goes to a display for the user and the input comes from the user keyboard, mouse, or touchscreen. Now, how fast can one of these interactive processes operate? It can operate as fast as your little fingers can fly on that keyboard, which is significantly slower than anything else attached to the computer. So an interactive process may take a long time to complete. Rather than let the CPU sit idle while the user is typing, the operating system will quickly switch the CPU to another process. Having several processes running in memory at the same time requires some form of memory management. In addition, if several processes are ready to run at the same time, the system must choose which process will run next. This is done by the job scheduler, which is a sub-manager of the processor manager or the process manager. Finally, running multiple processes concurrently, it's imperative that they don't step all over each other. In a multitasking system, the operating system must ensure a reasonable response time. Now, it sounds like we've got all of these processes running at exactly the same time, but the truth of the matter is the CPU is only working with one process at a time. But this management scheme gives the user and the jobs the illusion that they have that CPU's undivided attention. So, as I said, in multitasking in systems, the operating system must ensure reasonable response time. You have to admit, we don't have a whole lot of patience when waiting on a computer. For example, how long will you watch the wheels spinning or the dots crawling as you wait for a reply from a website? Not long, I'll bet. Also, the limiting factor on how many processes can run at once is how much memory is available. You know that in order for a program to run, it must first be loaded into memory. I hearken back to the old days when one of the error messages I hated the most was out of memory. Even today, when we have gigabytes of memory instead of the 16 and 48K that I used to have, we still find ourselves in need of memory. Yet we no longer receive that message. Because the operating systems today have been programmed to run a program without necessarily having to load the whole thing. The method for doing so is virtual memory, a technique that allows the execution of a process that is not completely in memory. The main advantage of this scheme is that it enables users to run programs that are larger than the actual physical memory of the computer. This frees programmers from concern over memory storage limitations. Multiprogramming and multitasking systems must also provide a file system. A file system resides on a secondary storage and, therefore, storage management must be provided, the file manager or the ma file management system. Back to that statement about processes stepping on one another, to ensure orderly execution, the system must also provide mechanisms for process synchronization and communication, and it may ensure that processes do not get stuck in a deadlock, forever waiting for
for one another. There's the process manager again. On the right is an image of a multiprocessing management scheme. Notice that the operating system itself must be loaded into a section of memory that will be protected against outside interference. That is, interference from other processes. As we have already found, a properly designed operating system must ensure that one program, an improperly designed program, cannot cause other programs or the operating system itself to execute incorrectly. To ensure the execution of the system, we must be able to distinguish between the execution of the operating system code and user-defined code. The approach taken by most computer systems is to provide hardware that allows differentiation among various modes of execution. We need two separate modes of operation, user mode and kernel mode. Kernel mode is also called supervisor mode, system mode, privilege mode. It's got a lot of names. A bit called a mode bit is added to the hardware of the computer to indicate the current mode. For example, kernel mode might be 0 and user mode might be 1. With the mode bit, we can distinguish operating system code and user code. When the computer system is executing on behalf of the user application, the system is in user mode. However, when an application requests a service from the operating system, a system call, the system must transition from user to kernel mode to fulfill the request. This is shown in the figure here. As we shall see, this architectural enhancement is useful for many other aspects of computer operation as well. At system boot time, the hardware starts in kernel mode. The operating system is then loaded and starts user applications in user mode. When a trap or an interrupt occurs, the hardware switches from user mode to kernel mode. That is, it changes the state of the mode bit to zero. Therefore, whenever the operating system gains control of the computer, it is in kernel mode. The system always switches to user mode by setting the mode bit to 1 before passing control to the user program. The dual mode of operation allows for protecting the operating system from misbehaving users and misbehaving users from one another. We accomplish this protection by designating some of the machine instructions that may cause harm as privileged instructions. The hardware allows privileged instructions to be executed only in kernel mode. If an attempt is made to execute a privileged instruction in user mode, the hardware does not execute the instruction, but rather treats it as illegal and traps it to the operating system. The instruction to switch to kernel mode is an example of a privileged instruction. The concept of modes can be extended beyond two modes. For example, CPUs that support virtualization frequently have a separate mode to indicate when the virtual machine manager is in control of the system. In this mode, the virtual machine manager has more privileges than user processes, but fewer than the kernel. It needs that level of privilege so it can create and manage virtual machines, changing the CPU state to do so. We'll talk more about virtualization later. Initial control resides in the operating system where instructions are executed in kernel mode. When control is given to a user application, the mode is set to user mode. Eventually, control is switched back to the operating system via an interrupt, a trap, or a system call. System calls provide the means for a user to ask the operating system to perform tasks reserved for the operating system on the user program's behalf. You remember our discussion about the application sending a request to the operating system to print. In all forms, though, 
A system call is a method used by a process to request action by the operating system. When a system call is executed, it is typically treated by the hardware as a software interrupt. Control passes to a service routine in the operating system and the mode bit is set to kernel mode. The system call service routine is part of the operating system. If a user program fails in some way, such as trying either to execute an illegal instruction or to access memory that is not in the user's address space, then the hardware traps to the operating system. Remember, we said that one of the responsibilities of the memory manager is to make sure that one process cannot intrude on another process's memory space. The trap transfers control to the operating system just like an interrupt does. A trap is an exception in the user process. It's caused by a division by zero error or by an invalid memory access. It's also the usual way to invoke a kernel routine, a system call, because those run with a higher priority than user code. Handling of the trap is synchronous, so the user code is suspended and continues afterwards. In a sense, they are active most of the time. The code expects the trap to happen. An interrupt is something generated by the hardware. Devices like the hard disk, graphic card, input-output ports, printer controllers, etc. These are asynchronous. That is, they don't happen at predictable places in the user code, or you could say they're passive, since the interrupt handler has to wait for them to happen eventually. When a program error occurs, the operating system must terminate the program abnormally. This situation is handled by the same code as a user requested abnormal termination. An appropriate error message is given and the memory of the program may be dumped. The memory dump is usually written to a file so that the user or the programmer can examine it and perhaps correct it and restart the program. Don't you hate it when that happens? We used to get what I call the blue screen of death. Fortunately, as operating systems have improved over the years, we have benefited by more graceful exits by the software. I believe that's enough for this lesson. We've covered quite a bit of information about operating systems, interrupts and traps and system calls and multitasking and so on. So let's take a break here and go back and look over your notes. Make sure you have a good understanding of those topics. And when you are ready, come on back and we'll continue with our overview of the course.